Silence, I love this. Okay, so I'm Frank Ferrastro. I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS, and I'm senior director of the Energy and National Security Program. And it's my pleasure as kind of the home team this morning to welcome you to this event. Um, we think it's extremely timely. This is a great topic. Uh, obviously, you can tell by the audience turnout that uh, it's a, an item that's of great interest in this city. Um, we've been playing with natural gas for probably a year and a half, going back to the roadmap that we put together with WRI, Roadmap to a Low Carbon Economy, recognizing the role that gas can play. It's portable, it's storable, now with the unconventionals, it's readily available. It's base load, it's peak, it's compatible with, with renewables. There's some great benefits to it, but you have to get the policy right. So when Adam approached us, Adam Sminsky approached us with the prospect of doing this joint session uh, with the Association of Energy Economics, we thought this would be a great thing to do. In part because we really appreciate the work that the association has done. It also gives us an opportunity to spend some time with folks like Adam and Ben Schlesinger um, that we always enjoy working with. And because the topic is so good and it's one we had great interest in anyway, we thought this would be a great time to put it together. Now in the past, some of you have attended, we have done single sessions on technology and the resource base and the economics and the above ground issues and the security impacts of, of having domestic supply to change uh, international markets. We've never tried to do all of this in one day. So we're going to see how that works. But I've got to tell you, the panel that's been, the panelists that have been um, solicited for their presentations today are just outstanding. I think you're going to get a range of, wide range of perspectives. We've got Bob Simon with us this morning to give us kind of a view from the Hill. We've got Murray Gerber coming at lunchtime and Joe Aldi to kind of close the day so you'll get a variety of different perspectives. This is one of those uh, opportunities, we think that the good day in think tank land is when you can actually uh, move the ball forward and put a little different perspective and upgrade the policy debate. Uh, Adam was saying this morning that his hope for an expectation for a good turnout today was if ah, we got 60 to 100 people and we have an entertaining day, I think on all counts that we will have uh, fulfilled our expectations. Um, let me welcome you all. There's a couple of administrative things. So first and foremost, uh, out of courtesy to the uh, speakers and also the people around you, since we have a large crowd today, this would be a great time to turn off your cell phones or put them on mute. Um, for those of you that have already uh, availed yourself of uh, the CSIS coffee in the back, you've already probably found the restrooms, which are down the hall and to your left. Uh, if not, you will find them shortly. Uh, the exits in the event, the unlikely event of an evacuation, you have a couple of different options. So there's stairwells that are clearly marked going out the doors to my right, to your left. Um, if you go one flight up, it takes you to the foyer behind the elevator bank that takes you out to K Street. If you go one flight down, it takes you to the garage level, follow the ramp up, and you exit on 18th Street. Okay? And with that, let me turn this program over to Andy Knox. Andy is the current president of the Washington chapter of the U.S. Association of uh, Energy uh, Economists, and then he can introduce Ben, and Ben will then introduce Bob Simon. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Frank. Uh, we are just thrilled to be uh, partnering with CSIS. Uh, this is the 14th annual energy policy conference of the uh, national chapter of the uh, uh, U.S. Association of Energy Economics. So this, this year is focused on gas. As, as Frank said, it's really one of the, uh, the pivotal issues in energy, energy policy. So we're uh, just delighted to be uh, having such an exciting uh, uh, panel of speakers all day today. Um, we would like also to uh, just, just thank CSIS for partnering with us in such a great venue. This is uh, right in the heart of downtown. It's a, as you can all see, this is a, a terrific spot. And we're, we're excited about the turnout as well. Um, I would just like to uh, uh, turn this now over to uh, Ben Schlesinger, a former president of the, um, of the, the USAEE uh, local chapter and uh, soon to be president of the uh, national, national chapter. Uh, before I do, I'd also like to uh, uh, thank Adam Siminski for all of his uh, hard work in organizing this, uh, and also uh, Mark Lively for his work, as well as the, the folks at CSIS for all, for all that they did. Um, Ben is an uh, uh, international gas market expert. Um, he is uh, often uh, advised leading corporations around the world as well as uh, spoken in front of Congress many times. 
So uh, he also has the distinction of being one of the, uh, the first uh, early adopter of uh, natural gas in his, uh, his personal life, being one of the, the, the first uh, purchasers of a natural gas vehicle. Um, so with that, I would just turn it over to Min. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I wish uh, I could say I was still, uh, that many people had done this, but uh, unfortunately, we still have the only house with natural gas in Maryland after 15 years. Um, I, it's a real pleasure to introduce Bob Simon, um, who is staff director, as you know, with Senate Energy uh, and Natural Resources Committee. Um, Bob uh, was formerly held position with the Department of Energy. You have his bio, and I won't read it. Uh, he's been with the Senate for um, 17 years. He's had a uh, uh, position with the National Research uh, Council, um, doctorate at MIT in organic, inorganic chemistry, was recently named a fellow of the AAAS, American Academy for uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, Bob, uh, I've seen Bob at work and spoken with him on the Hill. He's just, just uh, the kind of person with the experience and skill to uh, craft workable legislation. Uh, when you hear about bipartisanship, this is somebody who actually puts it to work and lives it and breathes it. Without another word, thank you so much for being here, Bob. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here um, this morning for this policy conference on the unconventional gas revolution. Um, as both uh, Frank and the others have said, this is a, a very interesting and fascinating topic. It's, it's a um, this it's sort of important topic, and this meeting is being uh, looked at today at sort of a pivotal point. Um, in our energy policy debate in Washington. You, it's easy to call it a pivotal point. My only problem is I can't figure out what direction it's pivoting in. <laughs> um, but let me start off by talking a little bit about unconventional natural gas um, as seen from the Hill perspective and the sorts of things that we're hearing from a wide variety of experts about unconventional natural gas and asking sort of a few questions that um, I suspect you're going to get around to exploring today. And as you um, develop your own sort of consensus about some of these issues, we would be delighted to sort of receive and process um, some of your conclusions and consensus uh, thoughts from this conference as we move forward on the Hill. Um, first question really deals with the size of the potential supply impact of unconventional natural gas. Um, it's looking like unconventional natural gas is going to be a major new development on the energy policy scene here in the United States, um, certainly in Canada elsewhere around the world. Um, the same sorts of geologies that we're exploiting now obviously occur in places like Poland, which are very interesting from sort of a geopolitical um, natural gas perspective. Um, if there are suddenly major new sources of natural gas supply in Europe, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting geopolitical um, development. Um, uh, Cambridge Energy Research Associates and, and Dan Jurgen's group um, actually is releasing a report down in Houston this week um, entitled Fueling North America's Energy Future, which is mostly focused on unconventional natural gas, which they present as a paradigm shift in our energy picture. And why do they sort of, you know, Dan Jurgen's not the kind of guy who's sort of given to gross exaggeration, so why do they have this highly optimistic view? And they point to some raw supply statistics. They, they think that there's, that we're adding essentially 1,800 um, billion, a trillion additional cubic feet to um, a domestic natural resource that um, will bring it all to about 3,000 trillion cubic feet, and that's kind of like a 100-year supply. Um, and so I guess one of the first questions is, does, you know, do people here in the room sort of generally think that's on target? Um, do they think that's high or low or, or what? Um, if we're seeing such a large new source of supply um, coming on board, that would seem to have major implications for what we're doing with liquefied natural gas um, and either, even major infrastructure projects like the Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline. So does unconventional natural gas take some of these things that, you know, uh, two or three years ago were seen pretty much as kind of ultimate long-term necessities? Does it make them more options and necessities? I think that's kind of an interesting question for us to deal with in the policy perspective. Um, obviously, natural gas um, has a lower carbon footprint um, per unit of energy produced and unit of energy consumed, so that makes it an attractive candidate for lowering the overall carbon content of our energy system. Uh, now, of course, producing shale gas is not without its own environmental issues, and um, some of them have gotten um, a rather intense focus um, in the debate here in Washington. 
Um, what sort of context we should put those issues in, I think, is an important question. How do they compare with the environmental issues associated with other major fossil fuel, like coal, for example? Um, we are certainly seeing resistance to unconventional natural gas exploration and production in places like New York State, um, and there are a couple ways of looking at that. Is, is it, are we looking at a, a more fundamental sort of technological and political problem that's going to be, may emerge as a showstopper, or are we dealing with the fact that we, people are beginning to produce a resource in a place that's not seen this kind of resource production ever before, and so there's some sort of learning curve that local communities and state governments are climbing. Um, along the Marcellus Shale Formation, and et cetera. And I think that that is an interesting question. And either way, what should our policy response be? I think that's an important question that we're trying to wrap our minds around. Um, if we are bringing new and large and, and seemingly stable supplies of natural gas um, online in the United States, does that smooth out price volatility? Price volatility has been quite an issue in natural gas policy over the last several years. Um, are we going to stabilize around some price point? And if we stabilize around five to seven bucks, is that a good price point? Uh, what, what's the implications of that as a, as a sort of a long-term price point for natural gas? Uh, will that be accepted by residential customers and industrial customers? A lot of them um, are, are quite price sensitive to, to natural gas um, in their operations. And then finally, the sort of the broader question is, what do we do with it if it's all, we have all this new gas? And you know, my thought is that it's the most likely outcome is that it's going to find its way mostly into the power and manufacturing sector. But there are other people who have other very different ideas. Um, um, you know, the, the thinking that I think we have up on the hill among some of us is that, look, you know, our existing infrastructure for distributing and using natural gas is pretty much tailored to, you know, the power sector and the manufacturing sector. Um, and uh, there will probably be an increasing demand or role for gas as some sort of transition fuel as we retire coal plants and as a backup fuel for intermittent sources like um, solar and wind. Um, and, uh, you know, one way of thinking about a, a wind farm is sort of a, a lower carbon footprint version of a natural gas plant, if you could look at it from that perspective. Um, but, but how does this group see it? Do, do, you, do you sort of see that as being the, the dominant place that is um, um, natural gas is going into? And if you sort of are thinking a little more deeply about the power sector scenario, you know, I think that there are um, a number of current assertions being made in the policy um, um, realm in Washington about, about natural gas that I think bear some closer examination. Uh, we certainly have Tim Worth, former senator, you know, a good friend, um, former member of the Energy Committee, certainly a good friend of, of many members of, of the Senate, including Senator Bingaman, you know, who are out there saying, look, this is, this, is, this is terrific. We can just change the dispatch order for generation and just dispatch natural gas ahead of coal. Um, and, um, and you, know, you know, presto changeo, you can see I have a little skepticism about this, um, you know, um, carbon footprints are instantly and almost immediately reduced. But um, aren't there a lot of coal plants um, located in places where there aren't good dispatchable natural gas plants uh, to begin with? And um, can you really run a peaker like as if it were a baseload plant? And um, so how realistic? What are the pluses and the minuses? What are the elements of realism and, and uh, elements of, of um, 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 optimism um, in this sort of dispatch scenario. I think that's a question that we're grappling with here in Washington, and if you've got some sage um, um, observations to make on that, I think we'd be very interested in hearing them. And you know, the second question deals with sort of the long-term future of natural gas. Let's assume for a moment that we convert all our coal plants over to natural gas. Uh, well, uh, eventually, um, the emissions curve from that generation mix does intersect the curve we're supposed to come down in order to get to some of these climate change scenarios, like 450 parts per million of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent in the atmosphere. And if that's the case, uh, we probably uh, need to um, um, figure out how to make carbon capture and sequestration work for natural gas plants. And I wonder what people in the room think about that. Um, do, do people agree with that sort of assessment? Um, that's certainly an assessment that is the International Energy Agency and their 2008 report on energy technology perspectives for getting to major reductions of greenhouse gases, and that was to a 50% reduction target in 2050. And obviously, you know, there are people who think that that's a way too weak a target, and we need to get to 60, 70, 83%. So uh, what is the connection ultimately between natural gas and, and carbon capture and sequestration?
Um, there's a different scenario than this sort of power sector scenario I've been talking about, and it's been the subject of also a lot of conversation. It's being actively uh, um, promoted by natural gas proponents, uh, most notably T. Boone Pickens. Um, and his thesis is that, you know, this, this gas is just terrific. We can just replace a, a, a tremendous amount of um, other fossil fuels in our transportation system with the direct use of natural gas. Now, we certainly see natural gas used in local fleets, um, um, and has been for, you know, a decade or more, a couple decades. Um, and it's got a fair degree of market penetration in that sort of specialized sector. But is natural gas sort of a sensible economic candidate for a sort of long haul um, of transportation from 18 wheelers? That's what <coughs> Mr. Pickens is proposing. And if you sort of think about that, you know, there's some, you know, sooner or later we get around to sort of thermodynamics. And, and you know, compressed uh, natural gas and even liquefied natural gas just has a lower energy content per volume than, than diesel fuel. So, so the way I sort of um, do the math, you know, if you, your average 18 wheeler with two, two big diesel tanks can probably drive around 650 miles before it pulls off somewhere. And it probably can refill those tanks in, you know, five minutes, seven minutes. You know, it's not terribly long at, at you know, it's not a terribly long wait on those, um, um, you know, fuel plazas off the New Jersey Turnpike. So now, if we're suddenly um, using the same form factor and, and using compressed natural gas, you know, maybe you're only going 170 miles before you have to pull off. And of course, it takes a lot longer to fill up with compressed natural gas. So you're talking maybe, maybe 20 minutes, you know, maybe a little more. Now, is that a problem? Um, how, how do truckers feel about that, I wonder? Um, you know, and so I do think that there's some practicality issues uh, associated there that aren't entirely clear to us um, as we evaluate these proposals. And I think that that would be um, worth looking at. And I did bring one slide that Frank is going to figure out how to put up. Uh oh. Okay. Which sort of gets to this sort of um, question of sort of thermodynamics. And what this slide is, is a sort of a wheels to wheels um, analysis of the energy efficiency of different kinds of natural gas options for fueling transportation, okay? So we sort of go from, it's like golf scores, so lower is better. You know, you know the more, the more, this is, the, the, the vertical axis is, is joules per kilometer as a BTUs per mile. So, so the fewer BTUs or joules you need per unit of distance, sort of the better off you are. So we could take natural gas and, and turn it into Fischer-Tropsch diesel. We know gas, we know how to do that. Um, that's a relatively inefficient way of doing it because you have to use up a lot of energy um, in system-wide from the well to the wheels to actually um, um, move very far. And so we kind of kind of go across. Now, um, you know, the sort of the let's fuel all the 18-wheelers, that's be spark ignition. So that would be the second um, item here. And then we sort of come across, we could uh, try to turn natural gas into hydrogen and run it through fuel cells. Uh, we can use um, s sort of um, com combustion turbines and then make electricity and uh, put it into plug-in hybrids. And finally, we can use combined cycle plants to put into plug-in hybrids. And you can see that actually from a thermodynamic perspective, um, turning natural gas into electricity, running it through the wires and into people's um, light-duty vehicles, is 35% more thermodynamically efficient than just having, having a compressed natural gas vehicle itself. And there are reasons for that. Obviously, you can burn it at a higher temperature and get more thermodynamic efficiency. You know, electric motors um, to uh, 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 wheel torque is much more efficient than um, in an in a, in a automobile, um, you know, sort of an ign ignition engine um, to, to, to wheels. And so, you know, y there are a number of systems efficiencies that come into play. So when you sort of think about the sort of the relative thermodynamic efficiency of your different options, right, does that um, um, convey any sort of policy messages to us here in Washington? And, and should we sort of follow the thermodynamics in terms of how we think about the use of natural gas in transportation or not? So that's kind of a brief tour of some of the high issues that I think um, come to us most naturally when we um, talk about natural gas. Like I said, you have a lot of interesting experts um, on the program today. Sadly, I have a, we have a hearing in the committee this morning that I have to go back to, but I do plan to check back in with um, Adam and Frank to see uh, what your general sentiments were um, and your insights were on this sort of collections of, of questions. Let me just say a few things, in, in, um, and I'll try not to go over my time, about sort of where we stand in this sort of larger policy picture at this point in Congress. And the first thing is to sort of note where we are on the diagram, okay? If you sort of look at the number of session weeks we've had already, 
and the number of session weeks that remain in front of us before October 8th, which I think is kind of the outside for when we um, you know, adjourn to have people go off and run for re-election. Um, we're sort of at the two-thirds point in this Congress, which is kind of you know, sort of surprising when you think about it that we're, we're that far gone. And so uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left in this year to, to settle up on a very impressive array of very thorny issues, only one of which is, is energy. Um, as, um, as was mentioned, the, the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, for which I work, and, and uh, which is chaired by my boss, Senator Jeff Bingham of New Mexico, um, and is, um, we have the good fortune of having um, Senator Lisa Murkowski as our ranking member, uh, who has been just um, a terrifically substantive um, person to work with, and um, also sort of has this, uh, uh, adheres to the idea that the Senate ought to be a place where we work things out on a bipartisan basis. So we've been able to produce a bipartisan energy bill. Um, we, we reported it out last June. Um, the American Clean Energy Leadership Act that addresses a number of what we think are the key sticking points in energy policy going forward. And I will sort of group them into sort of five general categories. One is uh, really the search for um, uh, new, new policies to accelerate the deployment of clean energy technology. And under that category are things like the Renewable Electricity Standard, our Clean Energy Deployment Administration uh, proposal, and transmission system improvements for um, siting um, and, and deciding on and, and making sure you can build and figuring out how to pay for improvements to the electric transmission system. Um, the second major theme of our bill is energy efficiency. And uh, there we uh, t take a real look at how to improve um, energy efficiency in the manufacturing sector, which I think is critical to the future <clears throat> health of the manufacturing sector in the United States, as well as energy efficiency in buildings and appliances. Uh, the third major theme of our build really deals with the energy innovation system. And there we've managed to craft sort of a bipartisan agreement on a long-term comprehensive doubling of our energy research and development um, um, programs of the Department of Energy. Um, as well as a variety of provisions that deal with energy workforce training, which is sort of critical to the future. Um, I think the fourth um, general area of, of, um, of enterprise um, in our bill is things I would call sort of energy market improvements. Uh, these um, deal with a collection of specific issues. For example, do we have an adequate way of ensuring cybersecurity electric transmission system? I mean, that is, if, if there is um, a major, um, you know, um, uh, information or cyber attack on SCADA systems, we're, we're, in, we're in deep trouble um, in this country. And there needs to be a way of, of uh, detecting and heading those off and responding to threats and vulnerabilities along those lines. Um, also the availability of energy supplies when our infrastructure is, de is the, particularly our infrastructure for the delivery of product is disrupted by hurricanes as we saw with Hurricane Ike. And then the whole issue of do we have really the adequate um, um, information on energy market, um, how energy markets are operating. Where is, where is all this um, product uh, that seems to be floating in, in offshore in boats around the world, and who owns it, and, and, and uh, when's it coming to shore, and how does that affect our thinking about energy markets going forward? So there's a lot of things that we could do to sort of help energy markets work better, since we do rely on market forces for an awful lot of the specifics of our energy systems operation and energy policy. And finally, the last um, sort of general category of things that we did on a bipartisan basis in the committee was, I think, comes under the rubric of transition to the future. These are things like opening the eastern Gulf of Mexico to um, oil and gas exploration. There's 21 trillion cubic feet of natural gas under the eastern Gulf. Uh, that's just the estimate at this point. It's probably more once you get started and, and, and learn more about the geology. And also things like carbon capture and storage, how to sort of get carbon capture and storage projects at a large scale um, demonstrated and what are the barriers to that, those kinds of demonstrations and what can we do from the congressional side to deal with issues like liability, long-term stewardship, the things that keep people from actually signing up for a project and say, yeah, I'll put a million tons of CO2 underground a year for 10 years to show that it can be done, you have to ask them the question, well, okay, after 10 years, you've got 10 million tons of CO2 under the ground, 
who owns that? You know, who's responsible for that? And I think that there are some issues there that, um, on a policy nature, that we can help with. Since reporting the bill, we've continued to work on a bipartisan basis. Uh, we have a bunch of hearings this week that are the fruit of that. Um, Senator Bingaman and Senator Murkowski have co-sponsored a very substantial a bill containing a number of additional um, appliance and equipment efficiency standards, including outdoor lighting, including sort of uh, embodying sort of a, a consensus that has emerged about how to deal with regional standards. Um, there are some real greenhouse gas savings associated with that. Homestar, we'll have a hearing on that this week. Um, and we are soliciting additional suggestions on a bipartisan basis for other sort of perfecting improvements or technical changes that people want to see to our bill which sort of leads to the question, once you all do that, then what do you do? Um, the path forward um, on this topic is a little murky at the moment. Um, Senator Reid earlier talked last year of a, of a sort of a method of proceeding in which uh, the relevant committees would sort of report out um, their work product and their areas of jurisdiction, and they would somehow then be integrated with each other. And uh, most of the committees that he initially had sort of nominated for doing that um, have not reported out legislation. We've reported out a bill. The Environment and Public Works Committee has reported out the Kerry Boxer bill, but that was with uh, some intended controversy. Um, Senators Kerry Graham and Lieberman um, are um, circulating around the Senate um, and talking to a lot of members, um, trying to see if there is a, a way of, of, of discovering 60 votes for a comprehensive form or a semi-comprehensive form of a cap and trade system. Um, that continues to be a work in progress. Um, they haven't circulated a text yet. Um, we're hopeful that they will um, in the near future. And I think once there's a text out there, it'll be a little bit easier to see um, you know, whether they have um, come up with something that can get sort of the necessary um, um, support to advance in the Senate. Obviously, Senator Byron Dorgan, Kent Conrad, and, and the numbers of others have advocated for, you know, just take the energy bill that we passed and, and sort of be done with it and, and, and push that through. Um, obviously, Senator Bingaman um, certainly supports the bill that we reported out of committee. Um, I would sort of characterize, I had to sort of come up with a quick sobriquet for his um, point of view, I think it wouldn't be energy only, be energy plus. I think that he does believe that there are a variety of other policies that we can probably get uh, broad consensual support for in the Senate. Uh, that would be um, you know, very responsive to the need to get our arms around uh, the greenhouse gas problem. Uh, we're certainly talking to a variety of members about that. The activities that, ongoing activities in our committee are one, um, are one sort of um, um, example of that. But ultimately, um, as um, Senator Bennett Johnson, my first boss on the Hill, uh, used to say, sometimes the clock is your enemy. And um, at this point, I think that the clock is our enemy. Um, uh, we, are, we don't have a lot of time left. We have a very full agenda. Um, um, I think happily the, the president does have energy near the top of his agenda. Obviously, health care is the top of his agenda. <clears throat> but energy is not too, energy and climate are not too far behind. So um, you'll have Joe Aldi coming to sort of wrap this up. And I'm sure he'll have more to say about the president's uh, views. Uh, the White House continues to reach out to members on the Hill, including my boss, uh, to, and, and actually reaching out on a bipartisan basis to try to uh, assess uh, where we are and what can get done. So there's a lot of ferment. Uh, we'll um, hope that that all translates into um, some significant accomplishments in this Congress. So with that, um, I appreciate you having me, and uh, I've only put you five minutes behind schedule. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Bob, thanks. Uh, we have no time, but let's, let's uh, you know, we, do, we should take a question or two. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the mic to get to you. We're audio recording, and um, so it won't do you any good if uh, we have a hand up here. Please, is there a mic? Yo. Raise them real high. Don't, don't be shy. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, Bob McNally. Hello. Bob That's McNally working. with the Rapid Ang Group. Bob, excellent talk. Um, a question for you. Could you elaborate a little bit on the politics of uh, clean water uh, that surround the fracking uh, issue? And specifically, would you care to put odds on the likelihood that the exemption fracking enjoys under the Safe Drinking Water Act will be in place, say, by the end of next year? Thank you. 
Well, that's a, it's always hard to prognosticate how Congress will deal with any particular issue. Um, there are a variety of there are a variety of viewpoints on all of them. Um, I will observe that when the House um, uh, was considering its Comprehensive Energy and Climate Bill, um, this was a topic that um, they looked at, but then um, decided that they weren't quite ready to to address. And so I think that there's if, I, if we sort of have to start go go looking for data um, that would sort of illuminate what might be going on. Um, obviously, um, um, we have a bill. Senator Casey's introduced a bill on the topic here in the Senate. Um, we certainly have had a lot of briefings uh, to try to educate people on the topic. Um, you know, we certainly have been, I certainly have been in briefings um, from advocates on various sides. I've been in with advocates of think, people who think we ought to do something, who, um, you know, sort of talk about sort of various um, disturbing stories of people who've had their groundwater contaminated allegedly by fracking. Um, you know, the, I, I think that it's, it's, it's um, that's a very complicated topic and, and um, you know, it's, the, 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 the data there is certainly kind of murky. And, and you, when people sort of say that their groundwater has been contaminated, uh, oftentimes, you know, people, and we have lots of people, you know, who live up next to oil and gas operations in New Mexico, there are a lot of practices that happen in, in, the, in the process of drilling for, you know, exploratory wells, drilling, you know, production wells, producing from wells, um, uh, other than fracking, that, that in my own thinking, seem to be much more likely candidates for, for potential source terms of, of, of contaminants in groundwater. And, um, you know, and I think that there's certainly uh, an issue out there, particularly with older wells, about whether there's, you know, whether there's the cements on the borehole is adequate, whether that was, you know, and, and, and the problem, of course, is that, you know, in the oil and gas industry, we have, a, you know, we, people tend to think of it as just only a couple majors, but if, obviously in the onshore in the United States, we have a wide variety of operators, some of whom are just terrific, and some of whom sort of leave a lot to be desired, okay? So, so it, it, it is a, it's sort of a complicated um, question, I think, to confidently assign any one cause to, to um, instances of groundwater contamination. Um, people see unusual chemicals showing up in their wells. Well, were, were they from the drilling mud? I mean, you know, how do you know it was from the, the, the fracking thing? Now, I do think that one of the issues um, in the politics of all of this is sort of the, um, the, what I would call the mystery quotient. I mean, I think people make a lot of statements that, you know, nobody has any possible idea of, of what's going down, what people, what, you know, what you know, to toxic witches brews, people are injecting 7,000 feet into the ground, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I think that a little bit of that's overstated because I'm, I've, I'm, I'm fairly well convinced that people actually have material safety data sheets on the site that, that um, outline what some of these things are. I do think that, that trying to address this kind of mystery quotient um, part of it is um, a, probably would be a helpful thing for industry to do. I mean, the chemical industry uh, faced this issue 20 years ago um, in the aftermath of Bhopal. And um, they took some strong action to, um, you know, assure the public that they could find out what was going on at chemical processing plants, you know, and they were able to find ways of doing it that that obviously did not, um, you know, harm their ability to continue to undertake proprietary activities. Um, I do think that that's certainly uh, a d one dimension to pursue going forward in all of this. Um, um, but like I said, it's a, it's a complicated topic. Um, uh, it, you know, if we ever re get around to debating an energy or climate bill on the Senate floor, it, you know, the, the, those bills will probably be open to amendment. So it's always the possible subject of an amendment. Uh, we're doing what we can in the Energy Committee to sort of understand the dimensions of the problem ourselves and to sort of serve as a sort of a technical resource to help other people understand um, sort of the technical dimensions of the problem. Thank you, Bob. It's a real pleasure. Bob, thank you so much for, for being here, uh, presenting you with a certificate of our appreciation oh, for uh, appearing today in our hearing. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to meeting you.